Uh, I'm just, yeah, I think I'm ready to go now. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Shekhupe Shamsi. I'm from Charles State University, and I'm going to talk about parasites and food safety. In particular, my talk is going to be about a parasite that is a little bit unusual compared to others, and it's called Toxoplasma. As you can see, it's been written here. So usually when we talk about parasites, we imagine uh, creatures that look like a worm and we get infected with them by eating them through oral ingestion. And usually we associate, and when I say we, I mean also medical doctor, usually associate infection with parasites, with gastrointestinal uh, problems like a stomach, tummy, and things like that. However, parasites not are always like that. An example is toxoplasma. Let's first see what toxoplasma is indeed. It's actually a very tiny parasite. It's made of only one cell. And what you see here, every single of these uh, structures are one parasite. And if you look at the size that I put here for you, you can see these are actually quite very tiny. They are even smaller than normal cells, like our body cells, which means within each body cell in our human body, if we get infected, we could potentially have more than one of these parasites inside each cell. It shows these are uh, potentially dangerous parasites. And uh, they actually, in human, they do not live inside the gastrointestinal tract usually. They can be anywhere in our body, uh, within any cell in our body, from brain cell to lung to liver, anywhere you can think of. Toxoplasma actually is a very important parasite for many reasons, but perhaps the most simple reason to say it's very important is the number of people that are infected with this parasite. So this is the global distribution of people who have been tested positive for infection. And uh, as you can see, it's almost everywhere in the world. And including if you look at Australia here, and we look at this guide on the map, you can see that 20 to 40% of Australians are infected with this parasite. And um, this map has been published in 2020. But what does Toxoplasma do to infected people? So it depends. It depends on what category of people you belong to. If you are immunologically healthy and have no immune system problem, then a lot of time when you get infected right away, it could be like flu-like symptoms or even asymptomatic, which means you don't show any symptoms, you don't even realize you got sick, or you might have mild illness and because the symptoms are quite vague, no one knows what happened, you know, like some days maybe you feel you have headache or, you know, like a little bit of fever and stuff and it just by itself goes away. And that's why a lot of people do not actually realize they become infected. But if you are uh, immunocompromised for any reason, um, then the symptoms can be really bad. So if you're a healthy person without any immune system problem and you get infected and after a while the symptoms just go away, doesn't mean that the parasite has gone away. It actually remains in your system. And if for any reason in future, like for uh, organ transplantation and so on, your immune system gets suppressed, then this parasite can emerge. And depends on which part of your body uh, this parasite was located, the symptoms can be different. So you have a lot of uh, big medical words here, but basically it means uh, depends on whereabouts. So usually it's like a pneumonia because the parasite goes to the lung, but it also goes to the brain. It goes to the, you know, like you just think about any body part. It could be your eyes, anywhere. And it emerges from there and depends on that. The symptoms can vary between different people. And if it, we can't do anything about it, unfortunately, the consequences could be really bad or even death. And then I... Uh, we continue about what it can do to people, especially it's an important parasite. It's for, uh, for pregnant uh, women. And depends on, so if a woman is pregnant and hasn't been infected with toxoplasma before, but during pregnancy, the person become infected, then the symptoms again depends on which part of uh, pregnancy the person got infected. So during the first trimester, 
if a woman gets infected with toxoplasma for the first time, the damage is mo mostly to the fetus, which in form of a miscarriage and so on. So it is really bad. But then as the pregnancy progresses and we go toward the third trimester, there's then the risk of fetus survive is higher. But on the other hand, the parasites usually get transmitted to the uh, baby. And then later on in life, in the body of the baby, out of the blue, the parasite can emerge. So baby might not be baby anymore. It could be an adult and then cause problems like blindness. So, and uh, between the first trimester and third trimester, uh, something in between can happen, like deformed babies and a uh, lot of other problems. Anyhow, it's really bad and really awful. Uh, this is, for example, you can find this on ABC Hobart website that um, one of the ABC staff, you know, at the age of, I don't know, you guess the age <laughs> based on this picture, actually had this uh, problem in his eyes and then he got diagnosed by a stroke at the back of his eyes and then it happened to be uh, toxoplasma many years after it got transmitted to him when he was in his mother's womb. So it might be interesting the story in a plain language for people if they are interested to listen to it. Um, so, as I said, congenital toxoplasmosis so, or the plasmosis that toxoplasmosis that get transmitted from mother during the pregnancy could remain completely unnoticed until people get to the second or third decade of their life, and then the lesion develops in their eyes and usually cause blindness. Uh, complete loss of uh, vision or just partial loss of vision, which is, again, it's not really good. The point is, unfortunately, in Australia, our knowledge and our research lag behind the rest of the world. And plenty of things that we know about toxoplasma is actually based on the research happens in other parts of the world, like U.S. or European countries. And for example, in U.S., approximately 21,000 person each year uh, that are diagnosed only to this form of toxoplasmosis. And if you add the other forms of toxoplasmosis, it's much higher. Uh, having said that, maybe it's a good time. I say that globally, one third of uh, world population are estimated to be infected with toxoplasma, which means right now in this room, one third of us are infected. So globally, that's actually a huge number because if we say the uh, world has seven or eight billion uh, population, one third of it is like two or almost three billion people. So that's a lot of people infected with this parasite without knowing. This parasite is also interested, as I said, it's not our usual parasite causing uh, some uh, problem in our stomach. It's also known to cause behavioral changes. So the first, based on the study that happened in Czech Republic, uh, they realized that among infected people, uh, women that are infected usually become more flirty, whereas men get mo usually mostly into fights and stuff like that and become more aggressive. Then there has been more research and a lot of cultural changes and a lot of other behavioral changes, including psychotic impacts and schizophrenia. And some other things have been related to uh, infection with toxoplasma. It really can infect impact our minds. And um, the point is, altogether, if you look at all these impacts, you know, like people getting more attractive, maybe, or impacts their political beliefs and stuff, altogether, that means the parasite tries to uh, increase the level of risk taking in infected people. And some research also have shown that these parasites are more abundant in people that are involved into speeding, into car crash, and that sort of things. Anyhow, we are still learning a lot of things about this parasite. But I guess the question that you have in mind now is how do we get infected with this parasite and how this parasites find its ways inside our lung cells, brain cells, and different body parts. Okay. So this parasite actually is not a human parasite. This is parasite of cat. 
So it lives happily inside the uh, intestine of the cat. And when cat defecates, these parasites comes out to the environment. And when cat, again, it, it just gets distributed into the environment, anywhere, it depends on wherever it is. And again, orally, it goes back to the mouth of the cat and then easily goes to the intestine and just complete its life cycle like this. The parasite really doesn't need to infect anything else. It's happy just to complete and produce offsprings through the cats, as we can see in here. However, in reality, what happens is when, this, when the cat defecates and the parasite comes here, in the environment, there are many other animals and humans other than cats. For example, I'll just put a few things here, like sheep, cattle, chicken, pigs, human, but also we have like mouse, we have birds, we have beetles, we have uh, worms, anything you can think of in insects and all sorts of things, bees, butterflies in the environment. So, and remember, I said at the beginning of my talk, these are really, really tiny. Although they are one cell, they are like among the smallest cells. So these things can get picked up by anything else. They and you know, like they just sit there to be picked up. They don't, they cannot choose their host. And they get they can only hope they are picked up by cats. But in reality, they get picked up by all these other animals. So when they get to the body of these animals by ingestion, and they can only go through the mouth, they can't like penetrate through the skin or any other way. So when they go to the body of this one, these are not cats for them. They just want to go to the intestine of the cat and reproduce there. But when they go there, they actually get lost. And when they get lost, they can go anywhere in the body. They go to the lung, brain, muscles, and everywhere else, and just remain there. And they hope until one day these things die and they just you know come out from the body cells and eventually go to the body of the cat and inside the body of these animals they almost can live as long as they can but again we don't know it might be short limit short lifetime or maybe long but anyhow that's where they end up uh, which is kind of like a dead end for these parasites but they could also get transmitted from one animal to another until eventually they go to the cat. Like when human, it's the lamb or cattle or chicken, if these things are infected, it can go to human. So, which leads me to my next slide, which is how human get infected. So the main way is by picking up from our cats. Uh, I mean, let me correct myself. One of the main ways to get infected is picking up from our cats from the environment. Imagine this picture of having a picnic and imagine if infected cat was around this area and these things are there. So even if you don't eat these animals in the, during your picnic, but you don't, you have unwashed hands and stuff while playing on the playground, you could potentially pick up those parasites and get infected. But of course, you could also get infected by eating the meat of these animals. And also you can get infected through uh, your mother. So these are add blood transfusion, of course. So based on that, prevention actually is easy. Uh, as long as people know about these parasites, educate themselves and do something about it. But as you can see, many of us don't even know. And that's why one third of the global population are infected. Anyhow, prevention is basically very simple. Washing hands, especially after playing with cats and washing vegetables and things that uh, you eat or vegetable. And when it comes to uh, changing the cat litter, Pregnant women better to avoid doing that. And it's better to wear gloves uh, so that you can throw the uh, glove away and just be mindful that these parasites can infect you from your cat. But the main way of infection is eating uncooked or undercooked meat. And uh, which means you actually have to eat well-cooked meat. In Australia, it's been estimated, depends on which research and what year, like there is a research have been done in Tasmania in 1975, I think, that showed 70% of lamb or 67% of lamb that year were infected with toxoplasmosis. 
there has been a national survey by Meat and Livestock Australia a few years ago. I think that must be the most recent, and it showed that the Australian lambs, 20 to 30 percent of them, are infected with toxoplasma. But again, this is only about lamb. But remember, the parasite could be in many other types of meat people eat. So uh, that means you have to cook it properly. And again, we just say adequate cooking is difficult to give proper instructions. Uh, in 67 degrees, the parasite usually dies, but that means you have to keep the meat in that temperature long enough uh, in 67 degrees. It's not that one second, 67 degrees is going to kill the parasites. It has to actually stay, stay there a few minutes. And again, that few minutes depends on the size of the meat you cooking. Uh, so I have this in mind. Also, refrigeration and cold temperature and freezing can kill the parasite. But again, it has to be uh, for a duration of time, depends on the size of the meat you have. So these are only guides based on research happened overseas. In Australia, again, we don't know. And remember, the parasites can have different genotypes and different things, and we don't know that, you know, like the one that they have in Australia exactly responds uh, the same temperature or it might be a little bit different. Anyhow, to, this is my last slide. Uh, so uh, if you're not infected, what can you do? There are some treatments available, uh, but um, not uh, it's not always working. Uh, there are some research again happening overseas on vaccines against toxoplasma. Um, and uh, until then, until uh, the best and easiest way is we all focus on prevention rather than getting infected. And thankfully for this parasite, prevention is easy. Wash your hands, uh, wash vegetables and cook the meat you eat. That's pretty much easy. And um, Unfortunate, and the other thing that I think, so if you're public, that's what you can do. But if you're a decision maker, if you're somewhere in the government and things like that, really investing on having experts in Australia working on uh, parasites and diseases is very important because unfortunately, there is this um, subconsciously, we all think that parasites are a problem are uh, developing countries and poor communities. And, um, you know, modern countries like Australia don't have parasite problems, which is uh, actually a misconception and it's not true at all. So investing in on training people uh, that know about different types of parasites, including toxoplasma is very important. And also inclusion of adequate parasitology teaching, especially in our medical school is extremely important because our research shows that Australian medical doctors, unfortunately, uh, lack a lot of knowledge about parasites. Thank you very much. And uh, if, uh, as you know, I'm flying at the moment when you hear this talk. Uh, if my flight is not on time and I miss the question and answer time, I will be very happy to talk to you uh, through my emails. Um, so please contact me and I'd be very happy to have a chat with you about parasites. Thank you.